I offer my prayerful pranams at the divine lotus feet of our most beloved Bhagwan, respected elders, brothers and sisters, loving Sai Ram, and wish you a happy Holy New Year. Welcome to the first Region 3 devotional program for 2023. In a divine discourse delivered on January 1st, 1998, Swami says, it is only when every moment is cherished as new will the new year become new. The sacred way in which every moment is spent will determine the fruitfulness of the year. If you wish to lead a sacred life and have sacred experiences, you must engage yourself in sacred actions. The good and evil in the world can be changed only by the change in men's actions. Transformation of society must start with transformation of individuals. Our guest speaker for this evening has certainly been transformed by Swami's teachings. Dr. Vijay Chundi is a radiologist practicing in Stewart, Florida. He graduated from the University of Florida College of Medicine and subsequently completed a neuroradiology fellowship. He has been a teaching faculty member at the Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Medical Sciences for two decades and until recently, he has conducted online teaching sessions with the radiology residents. He is also a member of the content team of the Sri Satya Sai International Organization, which meets weekly and helps develop online content for the website. Dr. Chundi, his wife, Dr. Kiran Reddy, and their families have had many interactions with Swami, who has guided them in their lives. Sairam Brother Vijay, a warm welcome and happy new year to you. It is a pleasure to have you with us on this New Year's Day. Let us start today's conversation at the very beginning. Please tell us how you came into Swami's fold. Sairam Manu, um, Sairam, all the uh, people joining today. Um, happy New Year to everyone. Um, thank you, Swami. And, uh, and of course, I want to thank Swami for even giving me the ability to speak, giving me the experiences where I could uh, learn so much um, and uh, really giving me a new outlook towards life. Um, so the question is really a question, I think to anybody who's um, come into the spiritual way of thinking, uh, and that is how did you come to that? How did you meet Swami? Uh, the, to me, that's really thinking about spirituality. So Swami actually um, came into my life through my marriage or at least the introduction to my uh, wife's family uh, the year before. And then subsequently my meeting Swami uh, when he actually conducted our marriage in Whitefield in 1995, the summer of 1995. Um, that is a, only upon reflection really, because at the time I was very ignorant of all of the incredible blessings that were uh, coming to my life at this time uh, and for the, the rest of my life, actually. Uh, but the, this meeting of Swami was something that I totally, uh, before that time, took for granted. I didn't understand the significance of that at the time. And prior to that time, um, I was actually more interested in my academic pursuits. And then I finally got to the stage where my family was nudging me on to move on with life. And you've basically you've finished your medical training. And so this was 1994. So I'm about almost 30 years of age, 29 years of age. And it uh, was in Michigan and was introduced through uh, uh, an uncle, a relative in Southern California who knew my wife, Karen, Reddy's family, who's my father-in-law is Dr. Narendranath Reddy, and that family, and said, uh, my, so my uncle, who was close to our family since I was a baby, um, called me and said, you need to meet this person. She's wonderful. The family is a very spiritual family, but you have to understand, they really they follow this guru, this spiritual guide in India, and it may seem kind of odd to you, but don't let that, uh, don't let that uh, taint your decision making <laughs> like like that was a, as if that, there was something wrong with that because that was my mindset in that 
he kind of knew me and we were not an outwardly spiritual, uh, not outwardly spiritual or even outwardly religious family at the time. So, so I'll uh, let you know about an episode. This happened actually around Christmas time, uh, 1994, around that winter time before the actual marriage, which was the summer the following year. And so this is after my uncle introduced us and uh, I was in Michigan. My uh, wife-to-be was in Southern California and you know, she was also uh, finishing medical school um, and going through her residency match. And I was finishing my, I was actually in my fellowship uh, training. That's after residency, after, so I was a bit older. And so I was still uh, had some doubts if this is the way I wanted to go, but there's something that prompted me around that time to try to call them. And I, they weren't home. So I left a message on the voice machine. As it turns out, they were returning from India. Dr. Reddy and his family were returning from India and they just met Swami and were discussing this very issue of marriage. And Swami was guiding them through this process. He said, don't worry about the boy. I'll take care of the boy. Like, don't worry about him. <laughs> You'll take care of him. So as is like in most of our lives, these things with spirituality are very mysterious, very mysterious and happen sub liminally liminally and we think we know everything in this world we understand and have grasp of the situation but in reality we have very little grasp of what's really happening so when they came home they had a message on the answering machine which fit exactly what swami had basically told them would happen in india during their interview and so uh it, that was swami working through them through me to get us together and so the marriage was set for uh, June in Vrindavan, Whitefield, where uh, um, we then flew my family. And Swami is the ultimate host for, and, and marriage is, uh, is like the biggest thing that happens to, uh, at least in our culture, right? In, in Indian culture, that's the biggest event. So I, I was so fortunate. Not only was my marriage done at the holiest of places in the presence of Swami, which I was ignorant of really at the time. So I was ignorant of so many things. So Swami uh, kept, uh, kept uh, myself and my family in a cottage right on, right near the mandir where, where he was, where his, where actually where he stayed. And he, had, he provided uh, all of the, the things we needed. He had uh, these students that would take care of our needs and so forth. And there were all these people that came from uh, my father's village and relatives that came. So many people came. He helped to put up uh, them in the local areas. And so this was such a grand event. And so uh, we actually met Swami, the whole family did a day before, a couple of days before the wedding. But I'll, I'll skip forward to the actual meeting of myself and Darshan. And to me, this was all very unusual. I'd never been to an ashram. I'd never seen all these people in India. And this is the most unusual of sights. Because India to me, when I ever visited India, part of the kind of delight, but fear and all of these other emotions we get when we go to India is this mass of people and chaos and confusion. But when I was in the ashram, it was absolutely the opposite. There was organization, discipline, uh, and, the, and quiet. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The, the piece so I and so my father-in-law was seated next to me and my first meeting of Swami was at Darshan Swami came by and we stood up and my father-in-law introduced me to Swami and so what do I do like the ignorant person I am at the time I put out my hand and it said nice to meet you Swami so there I am I'm shaking hands with, and Swami put out his hand so that and he shook hands with me and I thought my father-in-law was going to drop down passing out from from like just shock but i never felt anything but accepted by swami and that's that's the point of the story is not to point out that i was not only ignorant but maybe a little arrogant about reaching out and shaking hands with swami but the acceptance of swami for me and the feeling i had is what i took from my meeting with swami it was not this feeling of here is god incarnate no, no, that, that was not my mindset of thinking I was going to meet God incarnate. I, I didn't have that feeling, but I had the feeling of 
real wonderful peace and acceptance. And I really love the place. So Swami asked, how do you like it here? That was the question he asked me. How do you like it here? And I said, I find it very peaceful here, Swami. So, you know, and he was just so gracious to everybody. And during the wedding, actually, that, that was a, quite an event. We were on the stage and Anu knows, I think Anu actually was there. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding and a couple, few people here on this call, the, the Lesh Patel Neelam, were there as well. And so um, there are all these people that, and Swami's explaining the actual wedding as it's going on. And I'm on stage and it's hot and sweltering and the Pujari was doing all this stuff. But, and Swami came up and did the final ceremonies where you walk and, you know, garlanded and we, we did all that so, it was absolutely an amazing event for me, which I've come to cherish and realize more and more as I've gone uh, a little more mature and understood uh, the whole concept, I think, better understanding of the, this idea of Avatar, Swami, uh, what, what I really want in spirituality. So that was my meeting Anu, with uh, Swami at the Vrindavan Ashram. What a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, way to meet Swami, right? I, I remember reading in the Shadi Sai Sacharita that no matter the distance, the devotee will be drawn to Swam Baba. Like he, he describes there like a sparrow with a thread tied to its feet. And when he pulls, we just come to him, right? And for you, it was through your marriage that Swami drew you to him. And it was beautiful how you described how gracious Swami was and how accepting he was. Not only that he was a perfect host, as Swami says, Rama was even the ideal enemy. Swami was such a perfect host for you. He made you feel comfortable. He asked you, how do you like it here? So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. It can be overwhelming, and I've experienced this too. It can be overwhelming to be face to face with divinity sometimes. And Swami would often say, you know, don't try to understand me. It's a futile exercise. Just experience me. He would say, Anubhavinchu, Anandinchu. Experience me and derive bliss. At what point, when were you convinced of Swami's divinity and how do you apply that understanding in your daily life? I think um, I'm still in that process of understanding, like trying to understand divinity and being convinced of divinity, uh, I think are very difficult concepts for my mind and my way of thinking, but it's been a process. And I think like for my mother, who's, I think, she was so innocent and much more simple. She had this great bhava, great under, great feeling whenever she would listen to MS Subalakshmi song to her, that was God and praying and so forth. So I think it was much easier for like my mother. I don't know because I am who I am, but it, it was probably easier for me because I didn't have this baggage of searching for gurus before or going from place to place. Um, and I think there was a lead up to this to answer your question better. There was a lead up to this. There's a preparatory phase, which we cannot understand. It could be lifetimes. You no, know, even that, how do we know? Right? I mean, our memory is this life. How do we know? But I think for me, what I do know is I've had wonderful parents as examples. And I've had experiences in my life, including seeing death, being a physician and going through and seeing the the real difficulties of life and death and contemplating on these events in life, good times, but especially, especially the sorrowful times. So loss of my aunt a few years earlier, who was like my mother, she lived with us in Miami and um, was a physician as well. And in fact, I came back and, and she wanted uh, my brother and I to come. And, and so this period of time, this was like 1991, I examined my thinking about what is this life about? What is this? So I, I was really thinking more deeply about that. And I was always interested in philosophy. And um, even though I wasn't outwardly religious, our family wasn't. So I, I think when this was happening, that was the churning process for me about marriage and, and joining this spiritual family, really. I, I mean, I knew if I was going to join this family, my life was going to be directed much more overtly towards that path. And so I clearly wanted that. I, I think that that's what it showed me. And so to answer your question, when did I know that Swami was divinity? I think it's when I started changing my behavior. <laughs> I, I think, isn't that when we really, when we actually start changing our lives is when we 
whether we can say all kinds of things like, oh, I know he's God. I know he's God. He made a ring for me. So I know he must be God. Okay. Because he did that. I mean, I was there. I've seen him do so many miraculous things uh, and in, through our lives and experiences of other devotees that I've talked to. But I think it's through my own personal feeling that and change of how I think and feel about others and act. That's when I started feeling, wow, these teachings. Uh, and, and, and that didn't just come like that. It, it came through searching and reading his writings. I mean, I said this to Anu earlier, just read Satisai Speaks volume one and two and just read them over a, a few times. And that's all of Swami's writings in different ways. And this course is the rest of the last part of the Advent. Um, same thing with, you read any of the Vahinis. And it's, they just strike somebody who's sincere as true not about being religious but true and that's the way it struck me so after i met swami i had this feeling of searching like what is that about peace when i was at that ashram so i i, I, I like reading so i would read those books the second uh, answer to the question is being around his devotees really made me think about what is family about? What is the nature structure of family? Well, you know, we don't choose our family. <laughs> They're family. But these people who I met who were really strangers would show so much love, gratitude, generosity spontaneously because I was, they felt I was a side OT. Not just that I was a side OT, because I don't think I could call myself a side OT at that time, but because Swami paid attention to me. Just the proximity of Swami to me gave me importance that, oh, Swami gave him attention and importance. Therefore, that must be some kind of special person. <laughs> okay. I didn't deserve any of that. He did my marriage. But as an example of that, there's two examples of that. Um, after at our wedding, it's a story of, uh, it was in Vrindavan, there was a I, I would see there's so many people, <laughs> so many people, but this white devotee followed us to Prashanti Nidham. So after our marriage, we went to uh, Puttaparthi. We, we came as a family there and spent time in Puttaparthi. So this guy was following me around and he came up to me and he was like paying me all this respect. And I go, what are you doing? Don't do that. I felt uncomfortable. And he's like, no, 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 Swami, you're, you're very, you know, you're very special and you're blessed. So he was trying to like touch my feet and do all this stuff. And I, I realized, it's not that I realized Swami was divine at that time, but I realized that I was in the presence of, of somebody, of a, of a force. I do, uh, really, I felt that inside. There's a spiritual force that's present here. It's real. It's palpable. And there's such wonderful influence on these people. Another example of that is shortly after our marriage, we went to Italy. Uh, for our honeymoon period. So, because it made sense, we had to all get back to work. So on the way back, we stopped in Rome and there were devotees there who in Rome and other places that knew of Karen and family and I, the, the love they had for Swami and how they practiced, I could just feel it. So I felt these wonderful feelings that I felt that, um, of that kind of like that acceptance so I almost felt that as strong or stronger in them than I did when I met Swami. To be perfectly honest, it was like that feeling of not later. Later, as I focused more on it, I, I really felt that with Swami and I'd be drawn to go back for more and more and more, like many devotees are. Um, but so it was through my own feeling and personal change and wanting to change through his devotees really that's how i so i, I think i've grown more and more faith i i, I will never say i it, it's very hard for me to to to, to uh, say that i am convinced of anything but i think about god swami is about as close as anybody could get to god that i could ever imagine there was a quote that you uh, on the guy while well, guy three was playing it was from January of 1968, Swami's quote, while Guy through was playing as a prayer uh, before you came on, Anu, that said, man can only comprehend God in human form. That was one of the quotes that was up there. It was kind of, that was a paraphrase of that quote. And Swami is here for that. That is, that, that is what I've come to understand. 
okay, this idea of God is just so overwhelming that uh, our, to be an Advaitist or to just have this blind faith. To me, Swami is not about blind faith. It's all about examination. I'm taking a long time to answer this because I think Swami asks everybody or most people, what do you want? If you have a chance to speak with Swami at some point uh, or have an interview, that's one of the most commonly asked questions. And I, I think this is at the heart of this is what do you want? And I, I think uh, he asked me that question too. And I don't think I gave an answer to that question. It was more of an introspective question of what do I really want? And, and that is to understand my own divinity. Why am I here? And to try to understand Swami is kind of futile anyway. Okay, and he said that in the, in the World Conference Discourse in 68. He goes, sages and incredibly evolved souls have been trying for eons and eons. And, you know, don't, don't, try, to too, don't try too hard to understand who I am. I, if I can just cut it to a nutshell. Try to understand who we are better. Very nice. So a lot of self-audit, self-reflection, and intense sadhana. That's what I took away from your sharing. And also, you know, it is said when the student is ready, the master appears. And I'm sure many of us have experienced this, even those of us who were born into a family devoted to Swami, they too realize that there is a time when Swami calls them. Um, you had mentioned earlier in one of our conversations about your affinity to the Gayatri Mantra. Now, a few weeks ago, we had discussed the importance of the Gayatri Mantra in this very group in our weekly regional devotional program. Can you tell us about your attraction to the Gayatri Mantra, if I can say so, and its importance in your sadhana? Um, yeah, to, to me, the Gayatri Mantra is, first of all, it's very simple to learn. Okay, so let's start with it. it so my kids actually learn Rudram and they chant the Veda so much better than me. And I don't, my, my mind is not that great at the memorization of these slokas, but Gayatri just came to me. It was the, it just was so easy for me to learn my and it made me feel good so let's go back to that feeling again because we have to trust our i'm not talking about like just emotions and passions here i'm talking about when you examine what that feeling is so i, I learned during the, as i read that mantra came to me it's not it's not that swami said learn the guy through mantra to me. it's not like that at all this mantra came and it came so spontaneously and easy to me that I would chant it a lot. In fact, after I started, and the meaning, of course, you went over with the group, the meaning is totally non-denomination. It's asking, first of all, with gratitude, recognizing divinity. Then really about illuminating our intellect so that we can grasp what that divinity is at, at least benefit from it. That's if, if anything, we can at least benefit in some ways, whether it's intellectually for schoolwork, whether it's in, in all ways, actually. Okay. So that's the nice summary of how Gary three is, is it's the ultimate and it's not denominational meaning. We don't even have to believe in a God, you know, you, you can. So to me, it just was the most logical, simple one. And it just came naturally. So how do I use it? How has it changed my life? I do Gayatri Mantra before bedtime. I do it when I shower. When I say I do it, I don't even think of it. It just is there. It's there. So, and at times I'll do it out loud where I'll be driving and it'll just be, and in the morning when I'm driving to work, I will chant it out loud. I like that. And sometimes I'll catch myself listening to the news and I'll just shut it off. And I'll just look at the sun because I go early in the morning. And so if the sun is there. I just drive, of course, paying attention to the road, but the, <laughs> the sun is there in my eye and the guy three is there. So bathing, driving, before I start looking at a case, I just chant the guy three mantra and just, you know, just ask for that extra help from the divinity inside. So that, that is how I use it. It's part of my life. And I'll, I'll just tell you a, a brief story about how I really got it. I, I believe established in my life was after we had the birth of our first child. So, uh, the Kishore, uh, Kishore Sai was born in 1998 and, um, I'm a light, light sleeper. So I, I get up and, uh, he's, he's also a very light sleeper. So Kishore and I are light sleepers. So when you get up in the night, you'd be wanting to be held or whatever. And I just get up and, and, uh, maybe sometimes a bit colicky. So I would be 
holding on to him and there comes Gayatri. So I would be with him and sometimes it'd be an hour, two hours. There's more Gayatri mantra chanting. And, you know, it was, it became like our thing <laughs> because I was off at work. I was off at work. Uh, and so this was our time together. And um, it, so it just became ingrained. And now it's, if I feel stressed, anxious, like if anybody says in this world that they don't have moments of anxiety, they're fooling themselves. This is part of living in this world. We all feel it a little bit. So that is my go-to. Like if it's for many people, it's Om Shri Sairam. Sometimes I'll do both. I'll start with Om So but it is there. It's always kind of in the back of my head. And I'll, I'll leave you with this about Gayatri. There's another really important teaching of Swami the Gayatri always triggers in my head, and that is constant integrated awareness. And it's not just Swami's teaching, but it's, it's really what Swami had stressed when you read the Vani and Vani series and stuff. It, it, really, it's for us to be connected with God. How to always be connected, the ABC that uh, Dr. Reddy talked about in his New Year's address. So how to always be connected is what constant integrated awareness is. And to me, it's through that Gayatri mantra. If I start feeling, because when our emotions get us, we are now disconnected from God too much, right? So it kind of puts me back in that spiritual channel. I love that. Always be connected. And our mind wanders. It's the monkey mind. So when the mind wanders, it's stressed about the different things going on in life. It brings us back to be connected to Swami. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Let's shift gears to a lighter topic. You had the opportunity to teach residents and physicians at Swami Super Specialty Hospitals. I know there was a time difference and it's day here, it's night there. And there, there may have been technical challenges. This was back in the 90s, balancing a full time practice here in America with young children at home. How did you manage that? You want to tell us a little bit about that experience? Sure. So there's a few stages to this. Um, when I first went to put the party, I did see Swami's hospitals. And one of the things that drew me also to Swami that I haven't talked about yet is the incredible good works, the Seva projects, and just all of the love through service shown by Swami himself and his devotees um, all over the world. But in particular, that super specialty hospital when I visited it, it touched me as this is the most unique place I've been in, uh, most unique hospital I've been in. It's kind of like the temple here. And, you know, Temple of Healing has been used to describe the hospital and all of Swami's uh, hospital institutions. So I felt that way. You go in and it's a totally different atmosphere than any hospital I've been in. You don't, it doesn't feel like this sterile uh, uh, place it doesn't smell like it either for the most part it's 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 really like being uh, in a temple so that that really touched me and said you know it'd be nice to do this i have this is what i do as a physician and and it'd be nice to serve but again as you mentioned i'm in the u.s and we have uh, both uh, my wife and i are physicians with busy schedules we had we then subsequently had children uh, a short while later in the late 90s so how do we do this? So I would go, we would go whenever we had vacations, uh, we would go to India, just like my, my in-laws, my ready uncle and uh, my auntie, they were always, whenever they had a chance, even if it was like a short week, they would be in India and then come back. And I found, you know, I'm a light sleeper. I found it kind of exhausting, but it, it was amazing to go there and work with the, there was no residency program, by the way, at that time. And it was just put to Parthi Hospital. 2001, the Whitefield Hospital emerged, and that had neurosciences, the neurology and neuroradiology services and neurosurgical services. And that's what I trained in as a neuroradiologist in doing procedures and uh, diagnostic. So that, that had uh, specifically even more interest for me because that was what I trained in. But in, uh, when I was in Puttaparthi, I did work with the, uh, with the staff and we worked with um, uh, and, and at least reading cases, doing something when I went there. But it was a drop in the bucket because how much can I come there? So I was kind of praying, like, how do we do service? And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a brief uh, thing. I, we both Karen and I asked Swami one time, Swami, you know, we're there. We're in a small town in South Florida. We want to do more service. And, and you know, everything has its time and place. 
and God knows everything about that whole, you know, the Kalatitaya. <laughs> For us, time is like right now is the most. It's it's we think it, we think of it in such short term references, but. So we asked Swami, he goes, how do we do service? How can we do more service for you, Swami? You know, he said something that it's not quite an answer to your question, and I'll get to that uh, about the hospitals, but he, he said to us, take care of your families, like to Karen, because he knew we we're both working and we had, we had kids at the time, just young babies, take care of your family. He just took all the stress off of wanting to do all this stuff and it made of course you have to take care of the family and it makes the most sense it's practical and it but it's the most important thing right we also know how important that is but that's not a simple thing to work and take care of the family but when the whitefield hospital was built in 2001 i would go there and started doing some procedures and training the uh, neuroradiologist uh, there was we actually did a coiled an aneurysm, treated a aneurysm of the brain instead of by doing open neurosurgery, which involves more intensive surgical procedure, you know, cutting open the skull and things. We do it by catheters. And we actually did a, a few of these cases very successfully there. But um, again, that involved actually going there. And it, it became after like a, by the following year, it was not going to be something that was going to be done too much. It was kind of, it was not really that practical for that atmosphere and that situation there. So uh, this was around 2002 and I was in the uh, interview room with Swami with uh, my father-in-law was also there. We were there and this came up about the hospital and, and I said, Swami, I want to do more of these procedures because I, that's what I wanted. Okay, it's not necessarily what was needed more, but this is what I wanted. It's what my skills were in. So I asked Swami, uh, how can I do more here? And Swami basically said, teach. So I didn't know what that meant. Like teach, yes, I, I you know what teaching means, but how I'm over there. So as it turns out, over the course of the next few years, years, so through 2006, 2007, a residency began that is training the doctors that would come uh, we would train um, doctors to be radiologists at the hospitals so they really needed teaching so we st started online classes and despite the difficulties of early internet access in Puttaparthi and in Whitefield we moved forward to the point where we were having three or four residents graduate each year and with a hundred percent pass rate in the DNBs which is the, the national uh, exam for graduates in radiology. So the teaching happened regularly after a period of several years after he said teach. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we'll try to teach. I'll, I'll keep going down there as much as I can. Uh, but it turns out it's on, you have to be patient sometimes when Swami says stuff, actually almost all the time, um, because we don't know what the time frame may be. Uh, but if you have that, desire to want to do the service or want to do something good you know his the sankalpa his sankalpa will be there that will of getting it done it just somehow happens and and it happened in such a wonderful way so so i've had this great fortune of physically being there teaching and doing and then learning that you know we move with the times and Chai, swami has always changed with the times uh so wonderfully so then i was able to do it while still working here and you know, we, of course, it's early in the morning, as Anu has said, it's like six in the morning, my time, and you have to prepare. But the residents, I, I like New Year's, I got all these New Year's greetings today. I'm like, okay, that's Garish, that's Aparna, and that's this. So these are all like my former residents. So I, I have a whole other life of a, being a teacher with residents, graduates, and so forth. So it's been a wonderful boon for me and keeping me constantly up to date on things and on top of stuff. So that, that is uh, a wonderful boon Swami gave me of being able to teach and participate in his medical uh, institutions in the way I, that I could participate. Um, so yeah, he knows best. <laughs> he knows best and everything has a time and place and we have to be patient. Patience. I, I'm not very patient, but he's taught me a little bit of patience, a little bit. Yes. But that desire was there. Swami says, if you had that noble intention, he makes it happen at the right time. And that's what happened with you. Yes. Um, we all do our own personal sadhana and have our own ways that we connect to Swami. 
And I know one of your connections to Swami is through your contributions to the organization, such as being part of the content team. Do you feel that this type of involvement is important to your sadhana? And how, how may others who may not have a center nearby, how can they contribute to the organization? We have several such members on this call. I'm asking for their benefit. So to answer the first part of your question, uh, do I feel it's important? The answer is yes. We all have something to give of ourselves. And even if you're retired, you know, uh, Swami talks about retire, like, you know, putting new treads on your tires when they get worn. And he use that all the time when talking about ashramites, you know, people that would learn, put the part in the ashram, they're old people, but then they'd be working in the canteen or they'd be working in the bookstore or doing some other stuff or working uh, on, uh, uh, in the hospitals. Um, so there's always something you can contribute. And being part of the organization gives you many outlets for, expressing your love for Swami through helping others, through educating others, through aiding if you can, if you have uh, ability to edit or read things and help. There's so many different parts of this organization now, especially since the pandemic or during the pandemic and since where we have online access where like I'm remote, I, there's no center here in near me and there's no operational center anywhere close to me within an hour and a half, really within an hour, hour and a half. So um, we do a, a lot of our own personal sadhana, but we have so many uh, advantages of having the online touch through the organization, which the organization provides. So you can access for your own personal sadhana all the online resources of the Vahinis and so forth on our website at satisai.org and get wonderful updates. And so many people work like Nilesh Patel is on this call and he is part of the, the, uh, uh, the IT team. And that team, which is a small core of extremely hardworking people, keep the machinery running and they help along with the content team and others, the digital media team to keep content always up there. So the organization gives back to us and gives us the opportunity, gives to us a lot of spiritual information and a connection, a connection with others who we may not be able to physically connect with. Okay. Like we're doing right now. Okay. But there's many other ways. And, and I would strongly encourage you if you're interested in that to contact Anu also and others about what's available, um, that and, and discuss these things about what you'd like to do, what you'd like to help with, or uh, maybe what uh, resources you'd like to access. And we can always help you with those. So that's, that's number one. So the organization is important to be part of. It gives you a feeling of community, a community that, that you know, the, the Swami's physical presence isn't here, but we feel his presence when we're all talking, like right now. Um, you know, just watching as a prelude to this, when we're watching Gayatri, I was watching the Darshan I, and I was contemplating on the, I felt like back in 1995, I had these incredible feeling come up inside, like reliving it. And that's a big part of spirituality and our contemplation um, of having that feeling of God is here. God is, God is always here. And the organization helps us achieve that feeling of our own personal sadhana. Um, um, as far as, uh, the, the second part of your question was, uh, what was the second part of your question? Again, I just finished the first part. How, how can others who, are, who don't have a center nearby, how can they contribute? That was it. And you kind of addressed that already. Yes. So you can always reach out if you're not sure how you can contribute, because we need talents of many people, uh, to make the organization stronger. Thank you. Um, I once heard Levin Swami was in a Thrai session, an informal session with just a few devotees. Um, he once asked them, what is the rarest phenomenon? And they would try to guess and then they gave up at some point. And Swami said, it's, it's rare to be a contemporary of an avatar. And then he said, it's even rarer to know the avatar, even rarer it is to love the avatar. But rarest phenomenon, he said, is to have an opportunity to serve the avatar. And Swami has given us all of these various ways we can contribute as an SSC teacher, as a coordinator at your center, or like you said, all of those different ways they can contribute. So let's make the best of these opportunities that Swami is giving us uh, to earn Punyam. Uh, we have a few more minutes. 
Um, I'm sure I will get a message later and say you should have asked him to share more personal experiences. Is there one that comes to your mind as the most cherished? It's very hard to pick when I get asked this question. It's very difficult to pick one. Can you think of one or two interactions that were very sweet that maybe talk about Swami's humor and anything that comes to your mind? I think uh, Swami, yeah, he, just incredible sense of humor and presence. Um, there, uh, I, I think some of the most cherished moments were actually also just in the veranda when uh, we would sit as doctors and Swami would come by um, and just the one-on-one -on -one darshan, you know, the pr so I'll, I'll share two things. One was the feeling in darshan. And that to me was my special time with Swami that I, that I missed the most about being in, uh, in the presence in, uh, when Swami would come out for darshan and you would prep for it, right? You would sit there and you would... So after my initial couple of meetings, I, I came to realize not just through Swami's miracles because he created these objects uh, for me and other things. I've seen it for others and the Vibhuti and various other miraculous events, which, you know, my mind didn't go there that much of saying, oh, how's he doing this? Oh, he must be God. I, that's not the way I thought about it. But the most in incredible thing that I've always felt was that sense of peace I felt. So I really cherished those darshans, but I felt I had to prepare for them because I, in interviews and other things, I knew Swami was able to grasp what I was thinking, what I thought before, what I was going to ask. And sometimes I didn't even need to ask it. And sometimes I would just lose the ability to ask those things completely. So I would really work on my own personal side. And this is what I do miss. When you say personal experiences, I miss that, that preparatory part where I would just, kind of just do my guide through mantra and just think about Swami. And then that moment when Swami would arrive and we had the great fortune being working as doctors in the hospital, we get such a close darshan too of Swami. So not only watching him, but watching the faces of all those devotees looking up to Swami. It was a reflection, like a reflection of Swami and them was to me just so wonderful, just seeing their happiness and of, of, uh, of seeing Swami. Um, so that, that, is, that is one of the most precious sensations that I still get occasionally, of course, I, I get those feelings, but it, it was, it was like uh, instant meals with Swami. <laughs> it, was, it was guaranteed with Swami, right? So that was one, uh, but I'll share this one episode that I have that is especially touching to me that I've not shared in public uh, before. Uh, and it was 2010 birthday time. Um, Actually, it was, I think it was 2010, birthday time, the year before Swami passed, moved on. And I was there. My mom had horrible uh, end-stage lung disease, meaning she had pulmonary fibrosis, and she was slowly dying. And, you know, as a doctor, we, we know that. We know what the end point is, but we didn't, I didn't want my mom to suffer. Nobody wants that. So that was my prayer that I had inside. And I was just praying inside for her and for Swami to just alleviate her suffering. That was really my praying was, prayer was for Swami to alleviate my mom's suffering. And this is also when Swami was not interacting very much. Because Swami himself, from a physical point of view, was being pushed in the wheelchair. And, the, and it was also not easy from a physical point of view to see Swami like that when we had seen him so vital. You know, doing all these other things. But I, I, I kind of didn't really visualize Swami as the physical form that much. I didn't really think of him at, at that point because I felt so many wonderful things. So I was there real in, close to Swami prox in proximity as he was coming by. And I'll take another 30, 40 seconds to describe this. So Swami is coming with his attendants and I'm praying. And this is just before he's about to leave um the, the the veranda and and i made eye contact and he called me through through his eyes to come up there so i'm kneeling i'm going up and he materialized a, a, a chain with ganesha and he put it around my neck and said 
And in Telugu, that means give it to your mother. So he recognized what was what was what, what was really giving me the, the the sorrow, the bada, and he immediately he recognized it and he answered it. So when I went back, I put that around my mom's neck and I said, Swami gave this to you. Please just keep doing Gayatri. And when my mom passed, my mom was, we were chanting Gayatri and she was saying Sai Ram. And that's when she passed too, with that pendant around her neck. So that, that was one of my most cherished memories of how Swami just, you know, when you, when you ask that question about God, when did you know he's God? I mean, who else but? So I don't think I need to say any more. So, Beautiful. So, thank you. So special. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We feel very fortunate that we were able to hear it from you. You know, if there was one word to describe Swami, it would be love. And he felt your pain, your angst, and he responded. Very beautiful. Thank you, Brother Vijay, for bringing in the new year with us. You've given us a lot to listen, to contemplate, and to practice. As Swami would say, Shravanam Mananam Nididhyasanam. We hope to have you again very soon. And as we reflect on what you've shared with us today, let's end this segment with Swami's words, which will be followed by a few bhajans and arati. In a divine discourse delivered on January 1st, 1988, Swami said, on this New Year's Day, I wish you all every happiness and prosperity. The ancients used to bless those who come to them with long life of a hundred years and good health. They wish the people long life so that they may lead worthy lives, lead a long life, happy life, peaceful life, loving life and divine life. Redeem your lives by practicing divine love. Happy New Year once again and Jai Sairam.